Well, I guess I would like to um, thank you for this opportunity that I have to be able to talk a little bit about my personal experiences in human genetics and genomics. In 2009, um, I decided that for my birthday present, I would like to have a genome analysis kit, one of those personal genetics uh, direct-to-consumer kits that you can buy. Um, I, I consider myself being one of the early adopters for this kind of technology. And after paying $399, um, six weeks later, I got my results back. And these results were a little bit disappointing for me because, you know, being a genome-bound formatician, I found that there wasn't really anything there that was very interesting uh, at all. There were lots of uh, disease risks that, you know, I had never heard of. And pretty much all of them didn't show any sort of significant risk except one, which was that I had a higher um, risk of having uh, prostate cancer, something like 28% risk of, of, of having prost prostate cancer in my lifetime. That in itself wasn't too frightening or anything, but you know, because it was my top risk, I decided to basically look at a little bit further into that. And um, actually, uh, my first question was, how does this happen? Because there is no history in, of uh, prostate cancer in my family. My, my father or, or my, any of my blood relatives don't have or have not had uh, prostate cancer. So I thought a little bit, you know, this perhaps might not be true. That led me to uh, the, the following year to start sort of asking my family if they wouldn't mind to have their genome analyzed in the same way as, as I did. And in fact, this kind of analysis do not comprise the whole genome, actually. It just comprises something like a million genetic markers. So uh, once my family actually accepted to be uh, analyzed for their genomes, we decided to sort of start looking at seeing, you know, how, mm, you know, did I inherit this prostate cancer uh, marker myself that, you know, uh, increases the, the risk of prostate cancer. And I realized actually that both my mom and my dad for their higher risk um, uh, sort of component of this prostate cancer they don't actually have such a high risk for, for developing it. It's just that I, I happen to inherit the two components uh, from my mom and my dad that when you put them together actually make them slightly worse. So that was quite funny. Uh, because of that, then uh, with a friend, we decided to develop a tool, software tool for visualization of personal genomics. Uh, data coming from direct-to-consumer uh, companies like these ones. Um, and this, this package, which is open source and is available on the internet, has been recently published. And, you know, I've had the chance to actually think a little bit about the implications of basically uh, communicating this information uh, to my family, because when I perform this analysis for myself, it was fine. You know, there wasn't, you know, I understand more or, less, more or less the science that we are talking about. But when, you know, I analyzed my family and then I had to get back to them with the results that they got, that actually was a sort of process that they didn't expect in terms of how they were going to react and so on. So how would my family, how would my mom feel if, you know, Perhaps we could find that she had a higher risk of uh, developing Alzheimer's or one of these uh, diseases. So that was a huge challenge, uh, you know, how to sort of communicate this information to my family. Then um, also it was the, 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 the problem of, you know, I'm a scientist, but I have not been trained to actually tell this information of you know, genomic analysis to my family. Uh, so actually being able to 
tell this information uh, in a scientific manner didn't seem appropriate because, you know, uh, we are talking about the psychology of people. And I think that from that point of view, it was quite cumbersome for me to actually, um, you know, find, find the results and then talk to my family. Um, I think another really interesting process of analyzing the, the genomes of my family was the fact that, you know, we're starting to play as to, you know, whose genome is best. You know, if you can actually see all of the re reports that you get from the direct-to-consumer company and then you compare between each, each of the different members of my family, it was clear that some members of my family had fewer risks than other members of my family. So the question was, you know, whose genome is best? Um, and in fact, you know, obviously this is not a hardcore science and this is all uh, statistical sort of scores that do not necessarily reflect the actual truth behind what we know and, and what, what the actual scientific processes are. But it certainly raised, um, I guess, my um, awareness of, you know, how easy once you have this kind of analysis, one can draw eugenic conclusions. So that's a huge challenge. And then finally, I would say that, you know, um, these results that we have seen uh, in terms of risks, you know, there was one person in my family that was my auntie who actually has had in the past several episodes of thromboembolism. So she uh, actually had as her top disease risk uh, venous thromboembolism and that appeared in the genetic test. And I was thinking to myself, how am I going to tell this information to her? And um, I called her on the phone because we live now in different countries and basically I said to her, you know, auntie, um, it happens that when you, were, when you were born, you already had this genetic predisposition to develop venous thrombo thromboembolism. So in fact, the fact that you have had these, these episodes in the, fa in the past um, may not necessarily be because of, you know, dietary choices that you have made or environmental conditions. I think that this is one risk that, you know, you were born with and, you know, perhaps you should think about telling your uh, GP about this. And to my surprise, she didn't actually seem to be specifically uh, or particularly worried about it. And I don't think that she has even told her genetic practitioner, uh, uh, sorry, the general practitioner this information. But I think, you know, it's quite, quite interesting uh, the reactions that as a family we had when we are analyze our genomes. Finally, I think I would like to now mention about my latest plans. <laughs> um, as of last week, uh, at the end of January 2012, I decided to actually release my exome data uh, to the public uh, and make it public for people to actually analyze uh, this information and so on. I think this has been uh, a decision that I have made because um, there are so many tools out there uh, and frankly I can't keep up with all of the developments that are being uh, done and I thought that you know perhaps if I make this information available and I make it sort of uh, with a license which is in the public domain and allows people to actually analyze this data. Perhaps some researchers might come back to me and say, hey, I found this, you know. So um, I decided to make it public. Uh, I don't ask anything in return, except that, you know, if people find something interesting, they don't have to report back to me, but I would be really grateful if they did. And so, uh, it's only been a week since I released my, my genome and I've already had 
uh, contacts from two companies uh, specialized on genome analysis who have come back to me. And in fact, that day when I published that uh, genome information in my blog for people to download has been one of the busiest day in the, in, since I started my blog in 2008. So I don't know, I, I think that is really exciting that I'm doing this kind of work now and I just wanted to share with, with people here. So with that note, I'd like to say thank you for listening to this.